Okay. Week two of our 16 week format data science and big data analytics. <clears throat> this week, there was just some foundational stuff and uh, talk a little bit about the paper that's coming due in two weeks, but there's nothing due this week. Nothing due. So, uh, I'm going to record this lecture and I'm going to see which one of you watch it using advanced social media analytics. I'll be able to see how many of you watched it and for how long and when. Isn't that cool? Gotta love advanced analytics. Okay. So some, yeah, just back to some foundational stuff. Um, big data. Remember the, the three V's, um, uh, the initial V's came out, I believe, in 2008, uh, volume, variety, velocity. Um, volume, just a staggering amount of data going out there. Uh, I think I saw in the Walmart article, somebody posted uh, two and a half petabytes an hour at Walmart, all that transactional data coming in. But then you've got, oh, goodness gracious, when everybody in the world, how many smartphone users there are, it was 1.5 billion last time I looked. Um, there's a, an amount of data coming in that's just uh, incredible. Between that and uh, you know, financial transactions, social media transactions, um, video data, uh, just a huge volume of data. To me, uh, uh, I'm seeing... Um, at least as at the file size, I'm seeing volume uh, increasing mostly in video. Just incredible uh, how much room high quality video takes compared to uh, the volume of something that could, might be much more information packed, like a CSV of critical values uh, coming off of a transactional system. Uh, just text, uh, but it's formatted. So every single thing in it matters, you know, um, there's just, but yeah, uh, volume of, of video data is crazy. If you get a chance, go out on YouTube and watch rise of the drones from Nova, which is a PBS series, public broadcasting service. Uh, Nova Rise of the Drones. Um, they talk about a, a uh, an experimental drone that can watch an entire city and uh, the um, enormous amount of video data it generates. And that's just on one, one platform. If you had one of those for the top thousand cities in America, think about it. So anyway, yeah, volume, huge. And that's where we get... Uh, things like Hadoop file system, but that's been almost, I mean, a lot has been moved virtually into the cloud and that, that, uh, um, that distributed architecture gets handled for you um, virtually where you don't, you, you don't even have to worry about it. Like Google BigQuery, uh, it's a, a, a structured database, but it can handle uh, very large data sets compared to maybe, my sequel or something like that. So anyway, volume variety is the next thing that challenges uh, developers. You've got stuff coming in and st structured data. Uh, um, I'll, I'll call uh, XML or JSON data, particularly out of an API semi-structured because you kind of know, you know, you've got key value pairs. So you know what the key is, uh, username or comment or whatever. You know. um, but then sometimes it's got unstructured text associated with it. Like if it's a Google search string or a question coming from um, someone uh, or a blog entry or whatever. So I'd call that semi-structured. Uh, I've heard this all this term, uh, quasi-structured. Uh, it, it, maybe it was intended to be structured, but uh, it had a lot of dirty data in it. Um, maybe the, the application didn't check um, formats all that well or, uh, or the data is assembled from multiple versions of an application, which 
uh, I've seen had to deal with that, that that can screw you up because there were different business rules associated with different versions uh, of an of a of a system. And then you've got unstructured data that can be hugely rich in information. Uh, um, like just a, a document, uh, a, a book, a, a wiki page, whatever. Um, and images and videos uh, have an enormous amount of information in it. If you, if you think about it, sometimes you think about a, you know, an image or a video and the only data you think about is the metadata, like the name of the video, the date, maybe the length. Sometimes you'll get location data but not not always um, but if you think about what your brain analyzes when it watches uh, a video it it can decipher the topic the subject um, even if that's not in the name of the video um, and and y your your brain can identify each object in the screen so you can see Ah, I know, I know where they are. There's the address of their house or, oh, look, they're holding a Coke can. So that person likes Coke or you know, there's just so much uh, data that can be derived from video data using, you know, advanced uh, 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 digital image processing. Um, like, look at the, you know, the Google, think of the Google car and all of the using you know artificial intelligence and the metadata from the videos where they were and when what what direction the camera was pointed um think of all the things you could know about like when somebody's driveway is normally open or not or i mean sorry occupied or not um you know uh what time the mailman comes uh but it's just you know just a crazy amount of things you can derive from a video how many toyota corollas are there right now in <clears throat> key west florida uh well if you've got enough video uh you can count them um that you know just just the, the, there's a, an enormous amount of data right now a lot of it's just kind of sitting there but it's stored it's in it's in the cloud uh archived in these gigantic data centers uh, who knows what it what use might you know come of it uh, later? I don't know, even just for historical archiving. But I'm thinking of from data analysis. So yeah, huge variety, and it's coming at you a million miles an hour from all these different sources. So uh, like we talked about in the Walmart example, two and a half petabytes a, an hour. What do you do with it? Uh, and that's where we'll get into here. Uh, in other applications, you know, assigning a value to the data. How do you, you have to prioritize what you're storing and what questions you're answering from it because you can't do absolutely everything with, with all the data you have. Uh, this next slide is just an interesting in, infographic. Um, talks about the, mostly the sources and the volume, the variety and the volume of data that's coming in that um, database and application developers have to deal with. Uh, this next one, this next slide's an interesting <laughs> um, Venn diagram of the ideal uh, a data scientist, and there there are varying, you know, uh, explanations of what a data scientist is. Um, it involves elements of, I'll start on the right, of business acumen, uh, which is in the yellow, moving to, and programming or, or hacking, uh, statistics, math. Uh, if you, you know, can't understand statistical measures, you know, like whatever, everything, standard deviation, correlation, K nearest neighbors, if you can't understand those and at least apply them. You don't necessarily need to have to, you know, derive them originally, but uh, you got to kind of understand what's going on in these algorithms um, um, to to affect data science. And then communication. That that, that on the left, uh, if you know, 
there are people that can make discoveries and and uh and see interesting things in the data but if you can't put it into context and eloquently describe the significance and what's happened and how you came to these conclusions and defend your uh, your findings um you, you it might wind up uh being ignored so remember that um so yeah, so this Venn diagram, um, look at uh, like, like if you're pure business, uh, you're, you're an accountant. If you're pure programming, you know, you're a hacker. If you don't care <laughs> you know, necessarily about requirements or repeatability or maintainability or whatever, you're just hacking shit together. <laughs> kind of funny. Then statistics, uh, if all you do is statistics, you're a data nerd. Uh, communication with nothing else is hot air. <laughs> I love that one. Uh, and if you look at uh, the, the intersection of communication and business, but you don't know anything else, you're a salesperson. <laughs> love that one. But if you've got a balance of all four, we see here in the intersection of all four bubbles, the perfect data scientist uh, is a balance of communication, uh, statistics, mathematics, models, and then uh, programming and business. I think that's an interesting infographic. And then here are the, the uh, another graphic from datajobs.com, the, the intersection of math, business acumen, and technology. So whether that's programming in R or Python or RapidMiner or whatever, but um, you can't do this stuff on paper. Uh, there's too much, too much data and it takes too much time. So uh, a proper data scientist has to leverage uh, the technology that allows you, particularly for big data. I mean, you know, think about it. <laughs> uh, 15 million rows of data on paper. Um, anyway, uh, so there you go. So yeah, that, that's, the, that's what a data scientist, it's a business savvy communicator uh, that can use math and technology to uh, derive um, actionable intelligence from raw data. And then uh, another point I wanted to make is there's a, there's a life cycle. You, a lot of your uh, application developers, software engineers, and you're used to doing things in a cycle, you know, agile scrum where you're, where you're, uh, or, or, or agile sprint where you're, adding functionality, prioritized functionality to an application uh, using a, a fairly rapid um, cycle of requirements analysis um, and then uh, design, implementation, test, and field, CI, CD. Um, so analytics uses a similar uh, a, a similar approach or it can, you know, you, you, and you always start off with an objective. If, if somebody just comes and asks you, well, what's the data tell you? Oh, okay. Well, that's exploratory data analysis, but uh, it's not focused towards um, uh, an objective, like a requirement, like a software requirement. So it starts off with an objective. And then uh, once you, once you know, kind of, you know, what the, the, the business leaders need to know in order to uh, make, you know, budgetary uh, or personnel decisions. Um, then you go and you understand the data. What, what data do we have? Um, and then you, of course, spend a lot of time cleaning and transforming data. Um, it may be in multiple systems. I know uh, my son pulls, <clears throat> the data engineer pulls data from uh, two different, completely incompatible point of sale systems and uh, lines everything up, transforms it and gets it into a data warehouse where it can then be analyzed, um, used by the, the, the Power BI and Tableau guys to, to put up um, dashboards for corporate leadership. So data cleaning and transformation and then enhancement. Uh, sometimes you're not, you, don't, you don't have the data that you really need. So you might have to go to, maybe it's something that your website isn't collecting that it could, 
So you wind up with an analysis, an analytical requirement that feeds over into a software requirement. Uh, could be that you go to an external source. Could be that we just, I just need to know the average <clears throat> of whatever, you know, Facebook users that spend time on whatever. And you need to go out and get that data uh, separately um, to kind of use it within your data science project. Um, and, and then of course the, the, the actual analytics, you gotta, you know, choose the model, choose the measure. Are we looking for the most of something, the least of something, how things correlate? We're we looking for, you know, uh, the way categorical data lines up with each other. How many male P or, or how many males do we have that are smokers versus females that are not smokers or whatever there's, whatever the, the measure is, whatever the model is, that's when you actually pull in that clean and enhanced data, do the data analytics, and then data visualization almost always, uh, uh, because humans are such visual learners, you almost always wind up showing uh, some sort of chart or, or, or graph. Um, could be as simple as a pie chart, could be as interesting as a, an animation that shows the progress of things in form in, in the form of data. Um, and what I'm seeing uh, animation used a lot is in, um, it's, it's not simple, it's a JavaScript library called uh, Data Driven Documents, D3. So you kind of have to be a web developer to, to do the, the coolest stuff. But uh, 20 years ago, I did a, a, an animation in PowerPoint that, that, that told a data story um, by just using a, an arrow moving across the screen, just using a, a PowerPoint animation. So data visualization is very powerful. There's uh, um, Edward Tuft is often cited as being one of the, the, the gurus of data visualization, but we'll cover data visualization in a, in a, in a future week. Um, so anyway, yeah, the, it's a life cycle. Remember that? And, and then once you field, uh, you know, operationalize a, uh, an analytics product, um, it, it will just generate more questions. <laughs> so you go through that cycle again, and it could be that during this cycle, you came up with a, a monthly, process all the way from the data through the analysis to the visualization to the publication and that stays but but it drives other questions so you go through the cycle again and again and again and again and again okay now there is a data analytics maturity model um, that goes from the most uh, normal to uh, the most cosmic um, descriptive analytics we've been doing forever, you know, the monthly report, what, you know, uh, what, what branch office sold the most of whatever, what salesperson is producing the most, or, you know, how many, how many gallons of whatever did we produce this month? What was the, the ratio of finished product to waste, or there's just any number of things. Um, and, but to say that, uh, that there's no value in those, I don't know. You see there's a, an X and a Y here um, as, as the value of an analysis goes up, the difficulty goes up. So I, I, I agree with that. I, it's from Gartner, who might argue, um, but I wouldn't, I'm, that's not to say that there's no value in descriptive analytics. Um, but then you can uh, you can start to look at multiple factors and get diagnostics is what, you know, we'll, we'll why did sales drop off? Well, we didn't advertise last month and sales dropped off or enrollment if you're a training provider or, or a school. Um, maybe, maybe you need to look at the, you know, the overall uh, um, demographics of your population. I know we're, I worked for a, a local university here in Arkansas for a little while, University of Central Arkansas. And uh, there they look at uh, how many kids are in school all the way back to first grade. And they, they start projecting enrollment based on, um, you know, the available number of high school graduates or projected number of high school graduates. And there uh, they look, you know, look forward. <laughs> um, and it, uh, um, 
it gets scary because the population chain has changed and there just aren't that many young folks anymore. We had a, a baby boom and now we're going through a, uh, uh, a population crash. <laughs> they're, they're just, uh, uh, schools are being consolidated and torn down. Um, so anyway, yeah. Uh, so what will happen? Well, you can predict with almost, you know, certainty, um, depending on your trending data and the certainty of the trend, um, you, you, you know, you can do predictive analytics, but nobody has a crystal ball. So as it gets to predictive and, and, uh, prescriptive, you know, how, how can we make it happen? Well, you know, How'd you make it happen in the past? But that doesn't necessarily mean that because a little something uh, had a positive outcome that a lot of the same thing is going to have an even more um, a, a, an even more impact uh, impactful outcome. Uh, so it gets harder, as it says along the x-axis. There, the, the difficulty. Uh, of describing, you know, what happened and why up to what should we do um, gets, gets tougher, but the better you get at that, the, the more, you know, the more value that decision has. Uh, some folks uh, around the data analytics team, um, uh, business users will generate your requirements uh, project sponsors, a manager that you virtually have to have uh, in a, 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 a sponsor, an advocate, someone who really cares, or uh, the analytics effort will falter. If, if, if you don't have um, an advocate, a sponsor uh, for a, a data science project, um, you're, it, it, it will fall on deaf ears and no one will care and, and then it'll die. Um, so that's just something to kind of, you know, look out for if you're, if you're leading the team, um, you need, you need to be hand in glove with your, um, your executive sponsor. Uh, project manager, just that, uh, uh, keeping track of costs and schedule, um, just like you would any, any other project, they don't need to know necessarily the mechanics, just like you don't necessarily have to be a, a, a genius coder to be a project manager for a software development. You don't have to be a, a, um, top tier data scientist to manage a data science project, <clears throat> but you track the milestones, track progress, uh, um, resources, budget, um, and schedule. That's it. it this, these things will have a schedule. You're going to brief the board of directors the results of this because they want to know the answer to this so that they can decide whether or not they're going to spend $500 million buying out some other company or whatever the case may be. Uh, so yeah, you got to stay on schedule. Uh, business intelligence analyst. I know one or two of you are, are doing dashboards in Power BI or, or Tableau. Uh, that's an important part of getting uh, getting the data communicated clearly um, so that uh, uh, business decisions can be made the more uh, up to date and and fresh and and uh, clear the visualizations are the the better and that's where it, it, it's good to bring in things like uh, you know thresholds and triggers and gauges so people kind of get an idea of how is that good or bad <laughs> you've got to figure out a way to uh to make a visualization that is easily understandable by your audience which may or may not be technology savvy they may be uh, a functional area expert dbas are just the folks that, that uh care and feed the database and, and uh do user roles and tuning and backups and things like that uh, data engineering, I, I touched on earlier, uh, moving data from place to place, not necessarily the analyst, although a lot of analysts wind up having to do their own data engineering. Um, but the folks that do uh, extract, transform, and load, ETL engineers, um, that, that normally you kind of automate all that. You're pulling data from functional systems and point of sale systems and supply chain systems. And you got to 
put it into a central repository where a you won't break a functional system because you wrote a bad query uh and and b it's in a, a repeatable usable format so that you're not having to do data cleansing and transform transformation as part of the analysis it's it's a clean pristine pool of data and that's normally the the job of a data engineer to, to work those processes and automate that um, and develop it, test it, uh, verify, validate it. Uh, and then yet, yeah, like we said, your data scientist, that's the, uh, the, uh, um, the person that's looking at, at generally newer things. And then there's the scientific method, you know, there's experiments and uh, experimental design and hypothesis design and confidence intervals and, uh, all that sort of stuff um, that you need to think and act like a scientist, regardless of what type of data you need to, you, you need to realize the, the, the industry standard uh, um, techniques for this stuff. But anyway, so that was just some background thoughts I wanted to get out on this week when we have nothing due, uh, but coming due you have um, uh, a literature review due uh, for smart cities. And we just, I just wanted to talk for a minute about what is a smart city. And there's all kinds of videos and, and uh, academic articles out there about uh, particular applications within a smart city. Um, uh, it, it often starts with traffic control um, and intelligently sensing things like when it's time to um, synchronize traffic lights, when it's time to close off lanes, um, how much and it gathers data, historical data and real-time data to see, um, you know, uh, how much traffic do we have at what time of the day and when is it best to utilize the, the resource, the, the real estate we have in the roads um, for example, Tampa, Florida has a, uh, a major expressway leading in, um, it's, it's an elevated lane and it's one way in, in the morning and one way out in the afternoon. Um, when to open up the HOV lanes to normal traffic, you know, all that kind of, so, so there's, there's sensors for that, but that, like, so that's the, that was one of the very first things and it's not very, not very cosmic, um, the, some of the, the newer stuff I've seen is, you know, s smart grid. Um, you've got uh, uh, green, uh, green energy um, elements within the city feeding into the, feeding into the grid. Uh, a lot of some, there's some security applications. You've got, uh, you know, traffic cameras and uh, gunshot monitors that can triangulate. <laughs> I, uh, I don't think I live anywhere. <laughs> Here out here outside of town in central Arkansas, I don't think we have any gunshot monitors out here. If we do, they probably go nuts because folks pop off around <laughs> out here in the country. Uh, but in a city, uh, I have seen, I can't remember what city it was. If it was pretty densely populated, if it was Key West or uh, somewhere where, where they had gunshot sensors and it could triangulate in real time immediately where a gun went off because of the, the, the particular uh, uh, acoustic signature of a gunshot and, uh, and the, the, when it reached what sensor, because, you know, sounds relatively slow traveling compared to light. Anyway, uh, all of all the above, um, to, to what could include at some point, you know, uh, smart mass transit that senses uh, um, you're, you're feeding uh, social media data and, and event data into, uh, into planning that feeds over into, you know, increased uh, police presence. So you, you, you plan budgetarily for overtime for the cops because of it. So there's, there's all this data uh, coming into a city. Um, that it's right now it's kind of, sh it's showing promise. It's mostly experimental, but you'll see when you do this literature review, there are case studies out there in the academic literature um, where, where different 
elements of a smart city um, uh, get pulled together to actually manage the 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 health and safety of uh, of the occupants. And and actually, the the one of the first uh smart city data uh visualization uses of data that that i think you get cited frequently it was uh there was a uh i think it was cholera uh might have been malaria anyway there was an outbreak i want to say in london and uh when when those uh patients were plotted on a map uh, you could tell visually that it was they were all centered around a well that uh, and that well had become tainted somehow. Um, so uh, that that was a a very 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 early primitive uh, example of what could be um, in the forms of a smart city. And now we have you know. Everybody walking around with a computer in their pocket with location-based services and uh, yeah, just a, 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 a ton of, uh, of data to deal with where depending on how you, this can, this can be promising and it can freak people out uh, to think of all of this. Cause you'd like on the right-hand side there, you see a camera for traffic management, a uh, camera looking at me. Oh, uh, so yeah, it, um, it shows promise, but it there's all kinds of concerns when it comes to privacy, um, data privacy and anonymity. And those are some of the challenges that uh, uh, you guys can talk about in your literature review. Um, but you know, don't don't write your literature review um, in your head as if you're going to prove a given point. Just review the literature. just just write up what uh, what happened. And I'm going to go into that here in a little bit. Okay, about halfway there. And uh, one of the things I wanted to talk about this week was social media analytics. I posted um, my dissertation, which was about enterprise social media. Um, so think, think Facebook at work, uh, Yammer, um, uh, SharePoint mainly um, in the in the military enterprise where I worked, and. Um, so Techopedia calls it uh, uh, collecting social media sites to about to make business decisions. So uh, that business decision can be an aggregated, you know, what what are folks thinking about a given topic? You know, what what um, uh, what can we use in the form of social media commentary out there to uh, to maybe affect inventory levels? Um, but it can also be made to affect the business decision at the individual level. Uh, I, I work with a couple of companies that, um, that have a fairly accurate, uh, could be scary if you think about it, a uh, accurate view of individual people based on, uh, uh, on social media and web searching and, and, uh, uh, public records, uh, the value of your house, you can project income on that. Uh, um, there's just a lot of data that, that rolls into telling a company about you, your preferences, um, whether you're married or single, where you're, whether you're a student or not, how old you are, uh, your political, political leanings, um, your credit rating, all, all of that gets um massaged together in ways that um like i said some people think it's magic some people think it's really alarming um and illegal in europe but they can do it in america because of gdpr so anyway uh yeah social media analytics now i uh have a lot of examples in my dissertation there you'll see where social media where networks, social networks were analyzed to see kind of like who, who knows who. And, and uh, they analyzed uh, uh, how, how social networking made people feel, how it affected productivity in a, in a, a very flat 
socially connected enterprise like Apple or Google, um, social networking uh, with, with it's all work. This isn't posting, you know, pictures of what you ate for lunch. This is work related wikis and blogs and file management. Um, uh, imagine using discussion boards instead of emails at work. Uh, that's one of the things I, I focused on in my dissertation as far as just a, a, an interview question is, you know, people come and go. People come and go a lot in the military, which was my population for my study. Um, imagine, uh, you know, they leave invariably, almost by policy, they, they delete your email account. So everything you said and worked on disappears, right? And that happens. That's still happening to everybody. Rely, still relies on emails, but especially for internal conversations, because you know you, you don't necessarily want to let everyone in the world onto a work-related discussion board where you work. Um, but if you use discussion boards, if a user disappeared, you know, uh, uh, left their comments, you know, they might make a very uh, valuable post to a discussion and maybe even attach some files, then they disappear. Well, if that was email, only the people that got that email are now left. Uh, but if you use discussion boards, uh, that discussion is now discoverable by everybody in the organization. And the content of that discussion is preserved. Um, I, I cannot count the number of times I'd be talking to someone who'd been at an organization for a long time, maybe a civilian when I was in the military, you know, civilians generally stay longer than uh, our uniformed personnel. And, uh, and I would be like, uh, Hey, I had a great idea. And somebody would say, Oh yeah, four years ago, we had a tiger team that worked on that and blah, blah, blah. And I don't know. I said, well, what happened to the information? I don't know. <laughs> it, it just disappears. Um, but social media can prevent that. And then there's, you know, a work related wiki. There are things that you need to know about that are specific to your organization. Um, so having a, 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 Wikipedia, a Wikipedia site, a wiki site within your organization can allow people to write articles that are work related about different topics and projects and people and whatnot. Um, that it's invisible to the outside world that can be a way to preserve information. So uh, there's, there's uh, all kinds of research projects that have been done using social media analytics. Um, and that's what, you know, I'll reinforce that you guys need to think like researchers. Uh, don't think like social media marketers and, you know, Google analytics. <clears throat> For work. That's great as a practitioner, but you need to think about uh, being, you know, what it means to be a researcher to craft and execute a research project. So I, like I said, I posted my dissertation. Uh, I, I, I would think about giving an A in the course to the first person that emails me and asks me a, uh, a pertinent, uh, insightful question about my dissertation. So your week four paper, nothing to do this week, right? Um, is a literature review uh, talking about uh, smart cities. Okay, so there's the instructions, easy enough. And as you know, uh, I worry about the instructions. So I wanted to use a few slides here to talk about what is a literature review. Okay, um, uh, here we go. From University of Pennsylvania, very reputable school. A literature review is a comprehensive summary of previous research on a topic. Uh, it surveys articles, books, and other uh, sources relevant to a partic particular area of research. So that's why I was, well, I've got a slide on it, so I, I won't accent it yet. You got to know what you're reading. You be dis a discerning reader. Don't just go, oh, this is a lot of text that kind of sounds like what the professor wants me to talk about. Uh, you got to know what you're reading. 
um, a literature review um, published. Some of you use them as your references. Uh, you know, it'll say it'll, it'll often it'll have the name of the topic. Uh, you know, smart cities in the 21st century, a systematic review. Well, a systematic review is a literature review, and they will tell you what databases they used uh, or, or what, um, what specific journals were good enough to provide articles about a topic um, and how they searched for them, what words they used to search in a meta search. Uh, engine to, to to find all the articles that they wound up categorizing, and then literature reviews can uh, generally they'll 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 follow some approach, and it it's not rigid, but it will be systematic. They'll tell you, okay, well we're going to categorize these by qualitative versus quantitative. We're going to categorize all these works by uh, whether or not they collect the data or not or if they were just a thought piece, you know, um, or they were a, a, a proposed framework or those, that sort of thing. Um, so what is a literature review? That's what it is. It's a, a comprehensive summary. And that's what you'll do for this smart city topic. Um, but they are also very useful tools. If you're, um, if you're going to do something on, you know, autonomous vehicles, uh, I would virtually guarantee you that there's now a literature review or more, or more than one that, that someone has written that summarizes the previous research on autonomous vehicles. Um, so, so the literature review itself isn't something you cite because it didn't, it didn't add any information to the body of knowledge. It just summarized previous research. But looking at the references uh, in that literature review will give you a, a, a great source of articles where you can then go in and uh, um, learn more about your topic. Uh, a literature review is also chapter two of your, uh, your research proposal. Um, if, if you've been following along uh, with any of your uh, your your dissertation preparation materials, you you know that you'll turn in a proposal first, uh, which is the first three chapters of your dissertation, and then um, and then you'll go and execute it and write the last two. So, yeah, chapter two is your your literature review where you basically prove to the university that you have mastered the literature mastered the previous research that you're not just doing something because you think it's cool uh you have to identify a literature gap um that you're fulfilling so uh and in a literature review you write about what another author said you don't rephrase what they said uh you have seen in class discussion where somebody posted this study da 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 da, -da, -da as if they did a study and then no, uh, it's like writing a book review back when you were in middle school, um, write about what the other author said. It's really not hard if you, if you're doing your own writing and, uh, and in your dissertation, you'll use this review to highlight the literature gap. Um, if any of you have concerns about, uh, being able to highlight a literature gap, shoot me an email. Okay, so why so much focus on literature? Why, why is this so important? Um, because it's all that matters. Think about it. If, if you did a research project and didn't publish the results in a peer-reviewed journal, uh, it would have no validity and it would have no visibility. No one would trust it, and uh, nor, nor would they even know about it. So uh, that's why there is so much focus on, on your being able to read and write uh, academically, um, because that's how we share knowledge. Uh, it's, it is a prerequisite for, for being a published author. Um, so, and you need to be able to tell the story about your topic um, to justify your literature gap. So, like read my dissertation 
if, if shoot me a question. Let me let me know if you if you, I, I walked my user through why there was a gap in the literature and my project was worth doing. Uh, and of course, it's required for dissertation. And also, uh, as a program, your PhD, I progr PhD IT program at the University of Cumberland's, um, being able to write clearly and originally is, uh, is, I would say, of critical concern to the university because there's so much uh, article spinning and plagiarism going on um, and, and not... And, and fake posts like replying to discussions and saying something that nobody cares about. That's not focused on the other person, what the other person said. It's just, just basic facts. Uh, there's citations that have absolutely nothing to do with the point you're making. Um, there's so much of that going on. Um, forgery, fakery, uh, um, that, uh, that the university is constantly uh, asking us to work on it. So that's what I, what I focus on. Some of my comments uh, in the class discussion may be, may seem harsh, um, but literally uh, the, the program is at stake. Um, so, and, and the program is only as good as the students that are in it. So sources of literature, your, um, it, it matters. You will see proceedings from conferences where people uh, um, posted stuff and some of it's just absolute garbage. There's, if you Google information systems journals ranking, uh, it changes from time to time and there are different um, universities and different people that publish lists. Uh, but journals like MIS Quarterly uh, come up frequently. Um, there are various IEEE uh, journals out there that are uh, um, full of peer-reviewed articles. And then there, there are databases out there that you have a lot of good luck with, Elsevier, Elsevier and, and Springer. Um, so, so pay attention to um, where it's coming from and then on Google Scholar, there's a there's a count of how many times um, an article has been cited, and if you click on that, it shows you the articles that were written afterward that cited that work. And uh, you'll see there's you know there is some there are some articles out there that that have uh, thousands of citations because. It's the seminal article. It's the first one that defined big data, or it's the first one that defined what social media is, or na name it. You know, uh, it proposed, you know, a, a framework or a law, or it's it's a, a a methodology article that that everyone uses to justify the methodology they they uh, they used for a given uh, project. So pay attention to what you're reading and, and start to recognize the difference in these different articles. And of course, textbooks, uh, particularly by uh, recognized experts, are good sources. Um, you will see conference presentations. Uh, if it's a peer-reviewed conference, um, pay attention. Uh, but very often you'll see the same thing that came out of a conference gets turned into a journal article. So you'll see the exact same name, exact same authors, uh, but there's two slightly different versions of something. And that's, that's what happened is it was, it was presented um, in support of a conference. And then it later became a published article. Um, of course, library databases are how you get to these things, but I start with Google scholar. And if I can't find the full text of what I'm looking for, I'll ask, um, a librarian to see if I can get it on interlibrary loan. Okay. And as I have been saying, uh, pay attention to what you're reading. Just because something has text that uses the jargon you're looking for doesn't mean that it, 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 it's doing anything like 
what you want. You know what I mean? It, there's different types of articles. Um, the, 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 the gold nugget, as I've said before, is original research. Uh, something that, that, that reviewed previous literature and said, you know, we've got a, we've got a trend going here. We got a, I got an idea. I wonder if, and then it proposes a hypothesis or a qualitative research question. Um, and then it goes out and explores it. Uh, the, 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 the authors collect data, um, and then uh, uh, analyze it and publish the results. And that is a research article. No kid, that's a, a, a no kidding. It's not a, just a journal, they're all journal articles. That's a research article that actually published the results of a research project. Um, there, you'll often see, as we talked about, literature reviews. And these are, uh, uh, generally reviews of original research articles, uh, but they will also include uh, uh, reviews of people that are just proposing theory and frameworks, which is the next type. Um, some, some folks will say, you know, there's a, uh, there's a phenomenon going on here and uh, a theory is like a statement that can be either proven or disproven. Uh, like the theory that the world is flat. That used to be a theory. Well, now the theory, <laughs> we say it used to be, eh, there's still some people that, that think it's flat. But anyway, you see what I'm saying? But there are theories out there uh, and, and models like, uh, uh, I want to say like um, the technical acceptance model, the TAM um, is a pretty uh, well fleshed out theory that technology goes through certain uh, um, phases of adoption, you know, early adopters and uh, uh, late Luddites, <laughs> late adopters, you know. So there are theor theoretical and framework propositions. A framework proposition might be something like the, the, the very first work that was done on um, enterprise architecture. So there, so there are, uh, uh, there are architectures in place for creating a, uh, an enterprise architecture like the DOD architecture framework, DODAF. Uh, there's a, a, an a open um, architecture framework. So the, the articles that propose a framework, um, it can then, then, they can then be adopted and people will write articles about you know maybe how much money was saved by adopting that framework kind of thing and then and and the the frameworks get codified as um an official way of doing it by whoever iso or the the department of defense or whatever um you'll even see book reviews uh um in the literature and uh, it'll come up on Google Scholar and it's not what you're reading isn't the article, it's a review of the article. And I'll go back to my main point. Pay attention to what you're reading and understand the nature of, of the thing you're reading. Um, and then there's methodological treatments and that's articles, those are how-to articles, how to do research. Um, you'll see an author called Crestwell that, uh, that is a, 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 he's kind of the guy in research methodology uh, articles and books. Um, but these, these methodological ar arguments or articles are how you will justify in, uh, in your chapter three you justify your approach that it's appropriate um, because of it, it's a, it's a, it's a, an, a, uh, an established methodology. So there's, and there's other, you'll see other types of literature out there, but the main point is to recognize what you're reading. It's often spelled out right in the purpose. You just need to read it just, and, and not just, <sighs> The, the the language in in the article as if 
you know, just snippets of this and that are going to actually uh, satisfy your requirement. Okay. So in most journal articles and, uh, and in all uh, traditional dissertation types, you're going to have an introduction um, that just introduces the topic and, and the, the, so what, the, what, what, why are we doing this? What, why, why does this matter? The purpose of the work. That's where you'll see whether it's a literature review or an original research article or, um, a, uh, a, a proposed, uh, new algorithm or whatever it's in the introduction of the article. Um, the literature review You'll, it, sometimes it'll be, uh, it'll say past work, and it just kind of frames what's happened before. Uh, and, and uh, you know, no one just comes out and says, hey, I thought this would be a great idea, so I did this research project. You, you, you always frame it, you stand on the shoulders of giants, right? You always use previous research to, uh, uh, to build on. Um, Almost all research articles will tell you the, the, the method that they use, their methodological approach, um, including if they're testing a theory or not. Um, and those are really interesting when you get an original article that says, well, we're going to test the technology acceptance when it comes to uh, home security systems or fitness watches or whatever the case may be. Um, and then they, they test to see if, uh, if it, um, fits that theory, if it, if it, if it won out. Okay. And then, uh, after that, they, they, they will discuss their findings and that's where you, um, you basically, and, and you'll do this in your chapter four, you just state what happened. You don't. You don't talk about the implications or the, you know, the uh, nuances or anything like that. You just kind of just say, okay, well, this is what we, this is what we found. 98% of respondents said this or whatever, you know? Um, so you either accept or reject, you know, the, the null hypothesis and alternate hypotheses and, and yeah, so findings are the facts, but not necessarily the, any, and that's where you come into dis discussion. At the end, they'll talk about uh, what, the, what it means, what their findings imply or mean uh, for practitioners. And then you'll see recommendations for future research. And that's, those are great for uh, justifying your literature gap in your dissertation. Okay. And not coincidentally, <laughs> these five areas that you see in, in uh, uh, journal articles uh, very commonly, um, they are the chapters of your dissertation. Okay. Citation tips. Okay. So uh, paraphrase your source's bottom line. If the bottom line of an article was that uh, people... Uh, are three times more likely to stay with a company that has good leadership as opposed to pay or benefits or location or whatever, you know, they'll look at, say they, they looked at retention factors. Um, if, if you're, if that's their finding, their main finding, that's what that article is good for as a citation. Um, you, you know, uh, you wouldn't use that to, to, if you made the statement, you know, that, uh, people work at jobs or, or something generic like that, you know, you, you, you want to, the, the, the purpose of citing a source is to add credibility to what you have written. So if, if you add a source whose bottom line emphasizes what you just wrote that's appropriate uh if the article happened to have a buzzword that kind of had something to do with what you're writing and you cite that that's fake that's trying to write 
and trying to make it look like an academic article because it had an APA formatted reference in it. And that's what I'm seeing uh, uh, all too frequently. And we'll see if we can't get you to change that. Um, so cite the original source when possible, not derivative sources, which means uh, if I ask you, why did you cite that source? And you say, well, in this, uh, on page three, paragraph two, they said that statement, but they cited someone else and all they were doing was paraphrasing what the other guy said. Try and go back to the original source. This is most important for your dissertations. Okay. So uh, um, when, when you're writing, take note of where in your reference um, uh, it motivated you to cite this, the, the, the source. Uh, all of my citations, like in my dissertation, um, I can point to a, a somewhere in that article where they made a point. They made the point that I was reinforcing. Um, but I'm, I am seeing some absolutely random citations in writing, which is, uh, problematic, but, uh, you don't need to cite absolutely everything you, you will in your dissertation. You can't make a statement of fact without a source. So you are literally knitting together paraphrased facts from other works to tell your own story, which a lot of University of the Cumberland students struggle with that concept. It's pretty simple, um, but it, it evades a lot. So at least it, the, your, the, the writing would lead one to believe that that point uh, is lost on a lot of the writers. So we need to work on that. Uh, so yeah, major points in your paper should be supported for the, this course. Okay. So in conclusion, uh, there's a whole lot of related and overlapping terms <laughs> that get thrown out there in uh, jargon. Um, Smart cities are a, 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 an excellent example for, for studying uh, big data applications and the challenges and successes of those. Um, remember when you're writing, focus on the requirements. Read the instructions and focus on the requirements. Um, I'm seeing discussion replies that are uh, just... Nothing to do really with conversing with the other person. It's just basic stuff that you're just trying to fill the square. I just, I just want an A. I just want to get through this class. I don't really have anything to say that's, you know, actual dialogue. Um, please stop. Please, please. Uh, when you reply to your fellow student, reply as if. They had just said something and you're going, oh, well, that reminds me of something at work or that reminds me of an article I read this week or, oh, I don't understand that. Can you explain that a little more? Uh, there's just so much square filling going on. It's, it's discouraging. Okay. So when you reply to someone, think about what they would reply to your reply, like a conversation back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Think about it. What, when, when someone posts their initial reply and you read it and you click reply, write something that they're going to reply back to you. Or at least something that somebody else in the class is going to reply to. Um, yeah, so much fair, square filling. It's discouraging. But anyway, uh, there you go. Week two. Nothing do.